controller. The controller gain, the integral time, the derivative time, and I was trying to teach you methods to come up with reasonable initial values of those parameters so you just don't have to guess or tune them by trial and error. Okay? So I'm not going to cover all the things that we talked about, but the, <laughs> I'm going to here, watch this. This slide tells you the tuning is important. It matters what the parameters are. Here, this told you what the goal was of tuning. These came up, came up with some quantitative measures of how well a controller is doing in terms of this kind of area under the curve idea. This was one of the tuning methods, which was this minimization of this ITAE criteria, which is this thing here. And um, then I told you some general trends that are revealed by this table and, and um, kind of hold true for all um, tuning methods. Went through a little example talked a little bit about how we could do this continuous cycling method while admitting it maybe wasn't the greatest idea to do in a plant if you want to keep your job. Okay? But we had came up with this idea that if you could come up with the ultimate gain and ultimate period, which means the largest gain that you can use such that you get sustained oscillations but they're, they don't grow, okay? they're, can, they're sustained, and the associated period of those oscillations, you could also use this to tune PI and PID type controllers. Okay? Um, and then I did mention that there's a way to do this automatically using this, this idea of relay auto-tuning that's described in the book that we didn't have the time to talk about. Okay? Um, and here was just a review from a previous lecture on empirical modeling saying that if you want to get a first order plus time delay model, which a lot of these tuning methods use, that you can do this using this method where you'd get a response, look at two time points on the curve, and then extract the theta, the time delay, and the time constant from that. Okay. Um, and then I ended with this slide. All right, so this is where we left off. That was quick, all right? So I'm trying to get, sometimes when I don't finish a lecture, I spend the first 15 minutes reviewing, and then I just get further and further behind. So I'm not falling into that trap, all right? All right, so let's say that you working in a plant, um, you're responsible, let's say you're a control engineer, or you might be a process engineer interested in control. Um, what you're going to find is the controllers don't work a lot. Even if they used to work, they don't work always. Okay, they fall into disrepair. Um, and I forget when, who did the survey. I think this was a survey by DuPont. They surveyed different companies about their use of control, and they found uh, like 35% of controllers at any given time are turned off. Okay? Um, that's what I mean by placed in manual. That means 35% of the controllers are not even functional. The operators tur are turning them off. They're so bad. They'd rather control the plant themselves, okay? This doesn't speak well of how well these controllers are maintained, right? Because, you know, in, when you get a job, you're going to find there's certain things that involve new exciting things, like designing new plants or columns or controllers, but you're going to also find most of your work is all about maintenance, just keeping things running, okay? Um, if things didn't break, you wouldn't have a job, so think of it that way. Um, and this says that the maintenance of controllers is not that great. This is actually over 10 years ago. Maybe things have improved a little bit. So, so it's very common controllers don't work. And what I'm trying to do here is describe what, what might be the problem if a controller is not working. Okay? One problem is the, is the sensor, or here called the transducer, may not be working. So if you're trying to measure composition and that controller is not working, there might be a problem with the GC. Like it's not working, it's giving bad values. So the performance could degrade over time, or it could just be essentially failing completely. The controller itself could be poor. Um, the tuning of the controller might be bad. Okay? In other words, the controller gain and integral time and things might be poorly chosen. Or the design itself, the overall design might be poor. Okay? So in, there's kind of only one design you know right now, which is the standard feedback. But there are other designs that we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks. And it might be that the design you've chosen, the structure of the controller itself is not adequate. Like PID control is not going to work, okay, for example. Um, you might have a problem with the control valve. This is, this is very common. So the valve isn't working. It's not working properly. It's got history, so it's, it's sticking, something like this, okay? Um, and this is a very common problem, too. Something's changed in the process. So when you tune a controller, you're tuning the controller to work for a certain set of process conditions, okay? Like a certain throughput of the plant. If someone changes the process dramatically, like they increase the throughput by 30%, it's very likely your controllers won't be tuned well anymore, okay? And if that's the case, um, 
you're going to have to do something, okay? So, of course, the problem is when the controller doesn't work, you don't know which the, what the problem is, typically. All you know, the controller's not working. How do you know the controller's not working? Because here's the temperature, and here's time, and here's the set point, and here's the temperature. All right. So somebody sees this, either you or the operators, and they say, hey, temperature controller on the, on the heat exchanger <coughs> E3 is not working. Then you look at it and you say, oh, wow, that's, that doesn't look so good. All right. So then the job is to figure out what's gone wrong and try to fix it. So if you're in a plant, um, I think I mentioned this before, they have data historians. So these are systems that store data, I don't know how exactly how long, at least six months. So if you're in a plant, I think I had you guys raise your hands, like maybe a third of you actually been in a plant. And if you go into a plant, there'll be a control room, typically in the middle of the plant, and it'll be, use, it'll con be controlling many parts of the plant from maybe one central control room. And in this control room, there's an area, usually in the back, where all the signals come in from the plant, and there's literally thousands of them. And for a temperature, you might be getting a measurement every, every you know, 10 seconds. So. That's an enormous amount of data to store and archive. So there's special programs that do this called data historians. They store the data. They, um, they have a way of um, storing it efficiently. And so once you realize a problem like this occurs, the first thing to do is figure out when it started. You say, like, when did this problem start? So you go, you go back to the historian. You tr load the data in, and you start seeing when did this temperature start to degrade? When did the control of this thing degrade? You might find two things. One is it started to degrade three weeks ago. Or two, it's always been like this. <laughs> and you're the first person that ever cared. Okay? Um, so in either case, so if you can find a specific instance when it started, then you can try to figure out what happened three weeks ago. Okay? So in, when you run a plant, the operators keep a log of everything they do. And then you go to the operators and say, what were you doing a week ago on Thursday out in this unit? And they're like, um, we changed the valve. You're like, uh, that didn't work well. You see, so you identify what the actual problem is. If it's always been like this, which is surprisingly frequent, I hate to tell you, okay, um, then you just kind of go, go about redesigning the controller, not worrying about what the cause is, because you're not going to be able to find the causes. It's always been like this. So this is what this basically says. Collect data. Actually, a better word is go get the data that's already been collected, okay? Determine if something has changed, like the operating conditions have changed. You might find, so in a plant, you guys are probably mainly think about things like our commodity chemicals. So like if you're running a refinery or a basic chem plant, for the most part, you don't change the operating conditions a lot. Okay? But if you're running a more specialty chem plant or a polymer plant, then you'll, you'll make lots of different products. And when you run these different products, they're called campaigns. The conditions of the plant can change a lot, okay? So it can be really hard to get all the controllers to work, because like in a polymer plant, you might make a different polymer every week. And some of the polymers might have a lot higher throughput or different reactor temperatures. So, um, so it's pretty common that there's actual planned changes in operating conditions that are causing your controller trouble, okay? So the idea here is that if you can identify the problem, um, you might be able to redesign or retune the controller to fix it. Um, luckily, you don't have to do this, but you send someone out in the field. Like you say, you know, the, heat exchange, the temperature control and heat exchanger is not working. Please go out there and check it for me. Please go out and like, check the thermocouple, check the valve that's controlling the cold water flow rate in, make sure they're working. Um, and then ultimately, you might actually have to redesign, um, retune or actually redesign the controller. So the point is, if you're a practicing control engineer, um, you'll be doing this type of work like half the time, I would say. Okay? The other half will be what I consider more interesting, doing new, interesting things that make things better. This is just trying to keep things functional. Okay? And if you're a process engineer, which you know most people, all things being equal, you'll start being process engineer. Um, you'll deal a lot with the control people because the classic thing here is that if things don't work, guess what the control engineer says? Problem with the process. Okay. Guess what the process engineer says? Problem with the controller. Okay. So um, this is an ongoing battle that we'll enjoy having for a long time. So even if you're a process engineer, 
and not a control engineer, um, you'll be very interested in the control of the plant because if it's not working, it's going to affect your ability to actually operate the plant, which is your job. Okay. All right. So here's a little example that I just put together just to kind of illustrate, again, how we can do things in um, MATLAB. This is actually simulating. So what I'm trying to do here is I have a, let's say I have a plant process described by this transfer function. I just made it up. Okay, it's second order. <laughs> it's got a time delay. I picked it of this complexity because I, I know a system of this complexity has an ultimate gain. I'm going to use Simulink to find the ultimate gain and ultimate period. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate this. I'm going to make this a proportional controller. I'm going to keep cranking up the gain until I get sustained oscillations. And I'm going to find the ultimate gain and ultimate period. Okay? Um, of course, when you're taking an exam or doing a homework, you don't really do this, especially an exam, right? You're not going to do this. So if you were to do this, and I'll give you problems on this, you would um, approximate this, get rid of this time delay using like a pade approximation or whatever I tell you, because I would tell you what to do. Then you would do direct substitution upon this transfer function. You remember that? You form the characteristic equation, specify, um, substitute s equal j omega. Then you would get the ultimate gain and ultimate period analytically, if you like. Okay? But I'm going to show you how to get it um, in Simulink. All right, so let me just pull this thing up. Got to admit, I haven't, haven't really tested this recently. Of course, it has to work, right? That's what they always say. All right, I got some other stuff going on here. Whoops. Let's just get rid of this. Okay, what's this guy called? Did I give it a name? Probably continuous cycling, I called it. That's disappointing. I missed it? Oh, yeah. Alphabetical order. It's always daunting. All right, so here's our simulation. At this point, I'm hoping that you wouldn't have too much trouble putting this thing together, right? So this is a standard feedback system. So what did I do? Obviously, so I dropped in something called a transfer function, and I entered the numerator and denominator polynomials as usual. If you want to have a transfer function with a delay, you have to add the delay separately. Okay, so you put in this delay <laughs> thing, and if you click on this, you'll see the only thing you really have to enter here is the actual value of the delay, which I guess I made one. Is that what is in the slide? Yes. Okay, good. Consist consistency is always good if possible. All right. So to, to put this together, you just have to put your PID block in here. You put your transfer function, enter your numerator and denominator polynomials, add your delay because the transfer functions don't have delays, so you have to add that on. And this thing together is the transfer function. Uh, put in the block so you can create the error signal set point. I mean, you've, you've done the rest. So this is not anything that I think you'd have any trouble doing, hopefully. And so if we look at what we have here, well, that's interesting. Those must be the final results. So let's see. Yeah. No, I don't want to do that. So I forgot what values. What values was I picking on the slide? This one's probably too small, I guess. So this is a prop in the way this controller is formulated. It's like enter the controller as a p term, an i term, and a d term. I told you before that you have to calculate these from the standard form. But at this point, all you need to know is that I'm entering the proportional term, which is the gain to be 14, I, ha I'm, I have no integral or derivative action to control. It's proportional only. Okay? I have to admit, I don't, I'm not totally sure what's going to happen. Do I do a set point change? Looks good. Okay. So let's just simulate this guy for 50 time units, whatever that is. Come over here. I see I've got something. Quiet. Um, thinks I'm not as smart as I am. All right. Holy smokes. Well, okay, that was a little too. <laughs> that's okay. That's a little too big. So that gain is 
that gain is above the ultimate gain. I thought I saw it on the slide, and then it was less than that. So what did I pick, 14? You can see that's way too large. I get oscillations all right, and oscillations grow. Okay? And again, e these are negative values, which you know, may or may not make sense. But we are talking about deviation variables, right? So everything's deviation from steady state. So negative value doesn't necessarily mean something that doesn't have physical sense. All right, so well, let me go back to the slide to get some guidance. Because I really don't want to iterate in front of you. Oh, I see. I need values more around 7 and 8. So I exceeded the ultimate gain, and you saw I paid a heavy price for it. All right. So now I'm going to go back to my simulation here, and I'm going to take a value of like 7. Run it. Plot it. And you can see this is below the ultimate gain, right? So y the, the simulation I'm running here is I'm doing a set point change from 0 to 1. Obviously, if you don't do anything, it's just going to be a flat line at 0. So you have to at least do a set point change or do a disturbance, perturb the system so it'll move so that it has a chance to oscillate. Otherwise, it'll be a flat line. Okay, So I'm doing a set point change from 0 to 1. At time equals 0, it takes one time unit for the system to respond because that has a time delay. And then you can see, OK, these oscillations are, are shrinking. Okay, so I'm, I'm below the ultimate gain there. And without further ado, I think this was the value, but I could be wrong. You think I could remember? I just looked at it 10 seconds ago. But so that's oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't sleep much last night. All right. I'm sure you, you, not a lot of sympathy because you guys don't sleep much ever, right? All right. All right, let's give that a try. Okay, that's looking pretty, pretty close. You see, I think th I think that was the value I had. But anyway, these these oscillations look sustained to me, right? Maybe I should run it longer and see if they're actually sustained. But I'm pretty darn close. And then if you want to get a period, I don't know if you know this trick in MATLAB. Have you ever seen? You have this little thing you can find. You see, I did this thing up here, and this allows you to get the value at any point on the curve. It tells you what the time is, x, and what the corresponding value of y is. That beats like trying to like look up here and say, you know, what guess what the value is. So here you can look at two peak values, roughly there. I didn't quite do it perfectly, and here, and you can conclude the period is the difference between those two. Okay, and then once you um, have that information. Back to the slide. Okay. So all I did on this one was I, I just okay. That's the one I just showed you. I picked one a little bit lower and a little bit higher to show you that that's the ultimate gain. That's not big enough, so the oscillations decay. That one's too big, so the oscillations grow. And I plotted them on one graph. It wasn't a great achievement. Okay. And then what I did was I, I took these parameters, um, which is the ultimate gain. I should call that KCU, not KC, sorry. KCU, that's the ultimate gain. Ha I just calculated that. I got the ultimate period by looking at the dif distance between the two peaks, just like I did. And then I plugged them into the Ziegler-Nichols tuning parameters. Sorry to do this to you. I know you hate when I do that. These, these, this formula here, KC equals that, tau I equals that. Okay. Whoops. Oh. Right? So those two formulas there. Actually, I tuned a PID controller. I'm not going back. Don't worry. But there's, a, there's another formula for PID. Right. PID. OK, then I took these values. Can someone help me remember these? Each person be responsible for memorizing one value. I can handle the KC. OK, 4.73. Don't disappoint me by not knowing what they are. OK, what was this? Wait a minute, are you sure? <laughs> huh? 
Okay, hold on a second. It's really bad when you get to the conclusion and it's like, oh, uh, whoops. That seems like the values you gave me. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh. All right. So you see, the problem is that these are not the parameters they want you to enter. They want you to enter, so the P is KC, but I'm not sure I have the enthusiasm to go much further here, but okay. They want you to write the controller like this. And we always write it like this. Therefore, we can conclude that P is equal to KC. Um, I is equal to KC divided by tau I. And D is equal to KC times tau D. Can someone compute these for me? Is that what you're doing, or are you checking your email? No, I'm, I'm <laughs> OK. All right. <laughs> This doesn't work, I'm really gonna laugh. But anyway. The first one, I is 0 0.8113. 0 0.81, that's good enough. Okay. Wait, 0 0.81, you said? Yeah. Okay, all right. And then um, 3.26. 3.26. Okay. Oh, you had to multiply them for the six, sorry. Yeah, this is gonna be worse than the problem I had before. Yeah. Okay. For this one? Yeah. Are you, you sure this one is this? Uh, oh, no, I'm going to like that. Sorry. OK, so is this one you concluded is wrong? This is really going slow. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to bed before 3 o'clock tonight. 6.85? Is this what we've concluded? Yeah. All right. Let's give it a shot. OK, we like the first one. We hate the second one. And. All I can do is pray that this is going to work. That's why they pay me the big money, people. Okay. Um, all right. So you can see that, you remember I told you that the, when I introduced these Ziegler-Nichols tuning parameters, I said they're designed to give you a one-quarter decay ratio. You, and you might recall the decay ratio. So if you draw a line here at one, okay. Actually, looks a smaller, but they're designed such that the decay ratio, which is this peak divided by this peak relative to the value of one, is one quarter. This actually damps a little faster than one quarter. It looks like to me, right? So if you drew a line here, is this this is actually even a blow there. But anyway, so if you if I saw this personally, I would say this is not good. That's my. I mean, it's too. It overshoots the set point by sixty percent, right? And I wouldn't accept that. And I don't like it to oscillate. So you can see, you can at this point say, well, OK, that's a decent start. And the first thing to do when you retune a controller is always the following. Reduce the controller gain. Okay, I don't know a great value. It's trial and error at this point. But now you know it's near 4 or 5, you see. You're not going to try values that are 20. You're not going to try 0.1. So I'll, I'll try 3.5. Run this. Plot it. Give it a different color because I'm plotting it relative to the other one. It's even worse. <laughs> this again is why I am paid a considerable amount. Okay, um, so that tells you, this tells you the controller gain itself probably isn't the problem. So I wonder. Well, anyway, what? Can we try the derivative gain? Oh, you see, the problem now is that if you change the controller gain, you got to change them all. 
right? And now I've really lost my appetite for this, but you can. <laughs> my hypothesis, if I made this 3.5 and then change these accordingly, they would all get smaller, okay? I can just, I'm not gonna do them proportionally, but okay, I'm tired of being made a mockery of, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, do the following. I'm just gonna make this a little bit smaller. Try this six and I'll make this smaller, like five or something. We'll see if we like that any better. What? Oh yeah. Whatever. Yeah. All right, so run this guy. Still don't like it, really. Now, now, I'm, now I'm in a real quagmire. It's like, if I pick these things small enough, so everything is in the numerator, right? Okay, so. Okay, that's a big change. I guess there's, you can only do so well. So I did, um, I did reduce the amount of overshoot here because you know, it was about 60%, now it's about 45%. But now, if you look, it's, it's actually gotten a little bit slower as well. So, all right, well, some things are harder to tune than others. Remember when I made that claim that if you were in the lab, I'd come down and tune your controller in a matter of minutes? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe 10 minutes instead of five. All right. Um, <laughs> All right, so that's the end of that. Good. Yeah. Why do you use this named oscillation to get the ultimate gain? I'm very curious that. So the ultimate gain is the largest gain that you can use for just a proportional only controller that makes the system have sustained oscillations. The reason we do that is because once we have the ultimate gain in the corresponding period of those oscillations, then you can use those values to tune a controller. So obviously you don't want sustained oscillations when you actually do control. It's just something, it's an ex a test or analysis you do so that you can get these values and then you can use these in tuning formulas. Yeah. So it's just, what can I say? All right. So th this is a lecture that has a lot of material. It's 19 slides. It'll probably take more like two. I should split it in half, but I never do. So. And it's an important slide, uh, or important group of slides, because, um, why is it in this mode? Because I've, I, it's weird. I don't, I'm not really happy with that. There, I like that. All right, so, so far what we've done is the following. I told you, uh, it's a PI controller. And now, please find good values of KC, Tau I, and Tau D, okay? But this is, at this point, this is the only kind of controller you, you know. The PI controller, you don't even know that there are other controllers, okay? So I wouldn't really call, I guess it depends on your perception, I wouldn't really call picking these parameters controller design, okay? I would call it tuning, okay? It's kind of like when you guys do des design, in the design course, if someone gives you a distillation column and says, please figure out what reflux ratio is required to get this product composition, that's not design <coughs> to me. It's analysis, right? But it's not actually design. You're not picking the column. You're not picking how many stages or anything like that. So now we want to start talking about actual design. How do we design the controller to s uh, obtain a certain type of performance? So what we've done so far is, you know, you figure out what tuning parameters of the controller are, and then you figure out what the response looks like, right? Like we just did. You can do it in Simulink. You can do it by hand in principle if you're taking inverse Laplace transforms. Um, and so the idea was you figure out the controller, then you figure out the response. The way we're going to do these design methods, we're going to first specify what we want the response to be, and then we'll design the controller to get it, okay? It's a more direct way, right? Because the idea here is if someone asks you, what is, how's the response going to change if I change KC? The answer is it's not that obvious, right? Because I just showed you a case where I thought I knew what was going to happen. It didn't happen quite the way I thought, right? So this is more direct. It's instead of specifying the controller and then figuring out what it does, you specify what you want it to do and then figure out the controller, okay? It's a, it's a better way to do it, all right? 
there's going to be two ways we're going to talk about doing this. One way is a little bit simpler, um, but less general. It's called direct synthesis. And then there's a second method that I probably will just barely start today, if at all, which is called internal model control. And it's a little more complex, but it's more general. Okay? And then I'm going to show you with these two methods that sometimes you get PID controllers and sometimes you don't. Okay? And I'll show you when to determine if it is a PID controller and when it's not. If it is a PID controller, this provides a whole other way of tuning a PID controller. Okay, I'll show you that. So you apply this method to certain models, and sometimes you'll get a PID controller. And if you do, this will provide alternative tuning formulas. And when people come in to, the, um, to me to talk about lab experiments, and we want to tune a controller, and they ask me, what method would you use? I always tell them, use these methods. Not the methods I've talked about so far, for reasons I'll explain. Okay? And then next time, do we have class tomorrow, by the way? I should know this. But when you're not sleeping, you don't know much of anything. All right, let's check it out. I know it's up to me. <laughs> it's not up to me. It's up to this piece of paper. All right, what is tomorrow? The, the answer is we don't, OK? Because I had a lecture there, and then when I went to look for it, it didn't exist. So I was kind of like, I didn't even know what I was thinking, because I put this together in like July. So anyway, I just said, um, that tells me we don't need a lecture if I don't even know what it's supposed to be, right? <laughs> All right. So no class tomorrow. We'll meet again on Tuesday. So I'm going to cover this and cover this, and you know, we'll have to see if I can get to this at all this time, but I'll get to it at some point. OK. So PID um, controller tuning. So we know how we do this, right? We, we fix the structure. So this is what I mean by structure of the controller. The equation is fixed. The only thing you can change are the parameters of the equation, OK? Um, and we've learned so far that you know, if you have a first order plus time delay model or you get, do continuous cycle and get ultimate gain in period, you can tune controllers that look like this. Okay? Um, and again, I consider this tuning or anal largely analysis, not really design. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about, start talking about now is what I call model-based design. So the controller is not restricted to look like this. Okay? Or we're going to do all this in the Laplace domain. So so I'm saying here's the controller equation in the, in the time domain. So this is the input. At this point, I'm, I don't care about control valves and all this. Okay? Remember, normally we call this P, and that's the signal that goes to the control valve, and that changes the U. But now I'm just going to call it U. Okay? All right. So And we know that. The corresponding transfer function for this, which I conveniently um, erased, what is this thing here. Okay? Okay? That's a PI controller. Okay? Its structure is fixed. Um, hopefully, you can see that we can also represent this. Sometimes it's more convenient to do so by getting a common denominator. And so this will look like. Um, Right? That's just getting a common denominator. So I just put everything over tau is. There's the integral term. There's the proportional term. There's the derivative term. Okay? This is sometimes more convenient, but this is a, you can think of this